When people talk about the best graphics card ever made, the GTX 1080 Ti is bound to pop up in said conversations. It's the most powerful GTX card ever made, and in a way, it's kind of the end of an era. But six years on after its release in 2023, how is it performing? Well, I've put it up against some games at both 1080p and 1440p to see how it's getting along in 2023. The 1080 Ti is a legendary graphics card which launched in the spring of 2017 and this is sort of around the time when I started to get properly into custom PC building and I just wanted that graphics card so badly at the time when I had a 1050 Ti. And three years after that in 2020, I did eventually buy this Strix GTX 1080 Ti, which served in my main PC for two years. And Nvidia truly created a monster with this graphics card, slamming 3,584 CUDA cores into its GPU die and coupling it up with 11 gigabytes of GDDR5X, which ran through a massive 352 bit memory bus. And this resulted in a astonishing performance back in 2017 as this was sort of the first graphics card that could do 4k by itself usually before that to do 4k you'd need to do sli yes i do miss sli as well but the 1080 ti was sort of the first graphics card that could just do it on a single graphics card if that makes sense. This is my old Asus Strix Gaming OC and it's one of the higher end GTX 1080 Ti's. It runs pretty cool, it runs relatively quiet as well and it does boost quite far, boosting all the way up to 1911 megahertz. And this is pretty substantial as the 1080 Ti is only rated for a 1670 megahertz boost clock. So GPU boost and an excellent cooler and PCB design here are allowing for very high clocks on this GTX 1080 Ti. I quite like the Strix cards from this era. I think they look pretty minimal and they're not overly designed in terms of aesthetics like the newer 40 series Strix cards because it's like they just didn't know when to stop designing the thing. And I don't think they look particularly good, but when you roll it back a few years with the 10 series, the 20 series, and even the 30 series Strix cards, they cool well, they perform very well, and they also look very good. And lastly, to power this card, you need two 8-pin PCIe power connectors and a 650-watt PSU. So, by today's standards, this card doesn't use a lot of power, but back in 2017, this was a pretty power-thirsty monster. So, for benchmarking today, I've lined the 1080 Ti up against some games at both 1440p and 1080p. These are the resolutions that I'd recommend on a 1080 Ti. I think 4K is kind of out of the question now. It's only got 11 gigabytes of VRAM, which for newer modern AAA games isn't enough for 4K. It's enough for 1440 and 1080p, but 4K is a bit of a stretch there. And to be fair, it just simply doesn't have the horsepower anymore. But all benchmarking has been done on my test bench system, which has a Ryzen 5 5600G, 32 gigabytes of dual rank, dual channel, 3200 MHz, CL16 DDR4 memory a Sabrent 1TB NVMe Gen 3 SSD and an Asus Strix B550-F Gaming. So, let's see how the 1080 Ti performs in 2023. Battlefield 2042 is more of a CPU benchmark than a GPU benchmark if I'm honest, especially on Conquest 128, but then again, the 1080 Ti performed pretty decently here. Setting it to the medium preset and at 1080p, the GTX 1080 Ti got 111 FPS on average with a 1% low of 62. Switching this up to 1440p, it got 73 FPS and 45 FPS for the 1% low. So performance in Battlefield 2042 at both resolutions is perfectly playable. Maybe even set it to the lower preset to get more frames, but make sure you're not CPU bound in this title. Next game up is Fortnite and here at 1080p it definitely does see quite a bit of a CPU bottleneck but then again that is just showing how powerful the GTX 1080 Ti is. Here I set it to my regular settings so that's DirectX 12 with epic textures and a far view distance with everything else being set to low and at 1080p it got 236 FPS on average with 149 FPS for the 1% low. Certainly playable and if you pair this with a more powerful CPU you'll be getting more performance here at 1080p. And the reason I could tell we were CPU bound is because at 1440p the average only drops by 23 FPS which is not as much as you would expect switching to a high resolution like this so yeah. 
and the 1% low also went down to 122 so at both 1440p and 1080p Fortnite is more than playable on this graphics card. Another shooter is up next and that is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and I actually did test this before they implemented the new boys update which just completely ruined performance so performance here is on the stable release of the game I guess. And at 1080p we got 137 fps on average with a 1% low of 85 which is which is pretty decent on this preset i'm not going to lie i'd probably recommend these settings and at 1440p the average fps dropped down to 102 with a 1% low of 58 fps so performance here is not terrible i'd probably recommend the minimum preset with the high textures at 1440p though gta 5 did exhibit some very weird behavior if i'm honest uh yeah it didn't really go down when we switched to 1440p so i'm going to have to say here this is probably another cpu bottleneck but i set it to the very high preset with two times msaa and at 1080p it got 117 fps on average with a one percent low of 87 fps and switching up to 1440p we only lose 4 fps for the average and we only lose 5 fps for the one percent low so yeah yet again the 1080 Ti is certainly giving my 5600G a run for its money. Horizon Zero Dawn is on the opposite end of the spectrum from GTA 5 and Fortnite as we saw pretty decent scaling switching from 1080p to 1440p. Here I set it to the favour quality preset which is one above the original and one down from Ultra and to be honest the game looks pretty great at both resolutions here and at 1080p it got 113 fps on average with a 1% low of 78 fps and at 1440p it got 85 fps on average with 67 fps for the 1% low so at both resolutions it's totally playable being a single player story driven experience next up is cyberpunk and for some reason with pascal gpus it never really performs that well here I set it to the medium preset, which I think looks pretty decent, yet I kept the high textures thanks to that 11GB of GDDR5X. At 1080p it got 80fps on average with 57fps for the 1% low, which I don't think is terrible performance at all, that's definitely more than playable. And switching this up to 1440p, the average did slip below 60fps going to 54 for the average there. And for the 1% low, 42fps here not particularly great but then again it's still playable next up is sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum and that is f122 here in my typical wet australian grand prix benchmark with the high preset enabled which i think is pretty decent for f122 the game looks very good maybe if you want a few more frames the medium preset might be a good one for you. At 1080p you got 153 fps on average with 88 fps for the 1% low. I'm not sure what happened there, I was expecting that to be slightly higher, but then again, it's not that much of a problem, it still felt very smooth. Switching up to 1440p, it got 128 fps on average with 81 for the 1% low, so performance was arguably more consistent at 1440p maybe as we've become less cpu bound so that might be another thing to factor in there but either way f122 is performing great and if you've got f123 with a 1080 ti i suspect the game's going to perform very similarly to this god of war is up next and on the high preset it looks pretty incredible and performance was also pretty good as well getting 99 fps and 83 fps for the average and one percent lows respectively for 1080p switching this up to 1440p got 81 fps on average with 68 fps for the one percent low over resolution here is more than playable and if you're playing at 1080p you'd probably get away with the ultra preset as well which looks absolutely incredible in this game Next up is Forza Horizon 5 and to be honest this one surprised me as well because Forza Horizon doesn't really like older graphics cards for some reason. Maybe that's more so with AMD but either way the 1080 Ti performed incredibly well here getting 108 FPS on average with 88 FPS for the 1% low. This was at 1080p. Switching up to 1440p and I'm impressed even more here as it got 97 FPS for the average and 81 FPS for the 1% low. So this is probably another sign that we were CPU bound in this benchmark at 1080p 
but switching up to 1440p, it's not actually that bad performance. 97 FPS in a racing game is more than enough. If you want a bit more FPS at 1440p, maybe lower it to the medium preset, keep them textures on high, and you'll be having a great gaming experience right there. Atomic Heart is a game that actually looks pretty decent, yet it doesn't take a lot of GPU horsepower to run this game at decent frame rates. Here I'll set it to the high preset and you've got 83 FPS on average with 66 FPS for the 1% low. Switching this up to 1440p and that average drops down by 20 to 63 FPS on average and the 1% low drops down by 15 FPS to 51. So both 1440p and 1080p the 1080 Ti is performing incredible in this game. Last game up today is Rainbow Six Siege and it is probably the easiest one to run to be honest but then again you can run Rainbow Six Siege on like a 650 Ti so this isn't really surprising to anyone. Regardless though I set it to the ultra preset because anything other than this will just be horrifically CPU bound at 1080p especially. However at 1080p, it got 270 FPS and 176 FPS for the average and 1% lows respectively, which is great performance. So if you've got a 240Hz panel, you're going to be having a decent gaming performance right there. Switching this up to 1440p, it got 213 FPS on average with 158 for the 1% low. So if you've got a 1440p 144Hz monitor, the performance here is totally fine and you won't have any issues gaming in Rainbow Six Siege with a 1080 Ti. So at both resolutions the 1080 Ti did perform pretty decently actually. I know some of these games are quite a bit older. I need to update my benchmarking roster. I just haven't gotten around to buying some of the newer games but some games in this list like Fortnite are constantly being updated and I've noticed over the few years they are getting slightly harder to run on older hardware so that is a thing to note as well. But at 1080p the GTX 1080 Ti has a lot of life to give and to be honest it's still excelling at games at this resolution. Even games like Cyberpunk you're getting around 80 FPS with the medium preset and high textures. The game looks good, let's be honest. The 1080 Ti at both 1440p and 1080p offers what would be considered mid-range performance in 2023. So it's somewhere between an RTX 4060 and a 4060 Ti. Yet you don't get the stupidly small memory buses and you get an extra 3 gigabytes of frame buffer as well. So yes, the 1080 Ti isn't kneecaps there. And Nvidia will be dropping game ready drivers for the 1080 Ti and the rest of the 10 series for a good few years to come. Even the 900 series is still actively supported by Nvidia, so I don't think there'll be an issue here either. And even if you want to play at 1440p in latest AAA games, the extra 3 gigabytes of video memory over something like the GTX 1080 or RTX 4060 Ti or RTX 4060 would help a lot in these newer games. And that's because they are starting to saturate 8 gigabytes of VRAM at 1080p, so yeah, this extra 3 gigabytes of video memory on the 1080 Ti will certainly help you out. And another tip for 1440p, if you've got a 1080 Ti or a graphics card that has this similar level of performance, just lower some settings. You could probably leave the textures on high, drop the quality preset down to medium, and you should still be getting at least 60 FPS in most of the games out there. So the 1080 Ti is good, there's no doubt about that, it still performs very well in 2023, but what are the downsides to this thing? And the main ones are it being a GTX card, it has no RTX features, and this is somewhat of a bad thing because ray tracing is being heavily pushed now and it's actually a viable rendering method unlike 2018. And the main thing I think gamers will be missing out with is DLSS. DLSS is a super cool feature and it's one that I use in quite a few games and because the GTX 1080 Ti has no tentacles it can't use DLSS but this has been mitigated somewhat thanks to AMD's FSR 2.1 technology which is open source and you can use it on any graphics card. Also because it's a GTX card it can't ray trace very well and that is because it's got no ray tracing cores. This is only a problem if you care about ray tracing though which I know most gamers don't so that shouldn't be a problem there. But if you want to get into ray tracing the 1080 Ti is certainly not the graphics card for you. It can technically ray trace in some games but the performance isn't going to be great so yeah. And another downside, which is not so much of a downside, is its power efficiency relative to its performance. 
For example, my RTX 3080 is undervolted and it uses around 30 to 40 more watts than the 1080 Ti, yet it gets almost double the performance, so the power efficiency gains there are quite a lot. Then again, the 1080 Ti, it's, it wasn't shockingly inefficient for its time, it was actually pretty decent, so that's the thing to look out for there. So as long as you've got a PC with a decent 650 watt power supply and decent airflow, you should be fine to go. And I think the 1080 Ti is actually a decent deal right now. You can pick up a very high-end 1080 Ti for less than £200 on the used market, which I think is an incredible deal. You'll get something like an Aorus Extreme or an Aorus Master. I don't quite know what the model name is, but it's a decent one. That is what matters. And they go for less than £200 on the used market. And if you're after a more lower end 1080 Ti, ones like this Zotac Mini can go for around £150 to £160, which I think is incredible value from a graphics card. Yes, it's not going to perform as well as this Strix card in terms of acoustics and definitely cooling performance, but it's still a 1080 Ti. But if you're on the other side of the coin and you want DLSS, real-time ray tracing and newer NVIDIA technologies like the brand new NVENC encoder which is a lot better on the newer graphics cards, I would recommend looking at something newer like the RTX 20 series at least as they do have the DLSS and real-time ray tracing features packed into them as they are RTX cards. So I'm going to end the video on this note. I genuinely believe NVIDIA created a graphics card so good with the GTX 1080 Ti they simply can't replicate it.